السلام عليكم ازيكم عاملين ايه oh sorry i forgot this is a this is a recording um, listen um, i truly apologize for not being able to be with you today uh, i wish i was had uh, the opportunity to uh, listen to the very um, interesting and wonderful talks that uh, you've had the uh, opportunity to attend in the past day or so um, Listen, I, I just want to start by thanking Dr. Iman Farhat, Dr. Samir Azat, and uh, Dr. Ahmed Samir for their very kind invitation to be amongst you in the Qahira. But uh, unfortunately, uh, prior commitments and, and circumstances have, have not allowed me to do that. In any case, uh, I have around 25 to 30 minutes with you today. Uh, in terms of my presentation, I'm going to take <laughs> the full time to talk to you about um, a topic that is very interesting to me, and I'm very hopeful that you will find um, interesting um, elements that you can use in your own research and in your own um, uh, uh, scientific deliberations. The issue of ethics and, and biobanking, I believe the, you know, the, the different talks that preceded me have touched upon them. I hope my presentation will be complementary as much as possible. Uh, so I really want to focus today on the ethical and legal issues that uh, pertain to um, biobanking. And um, this this is something that has been discussed for many, many years. Uh, I'm sure many of you who have followed this um, have probably heard about it 10, 15 years ago. Uh, we're still debating most of the same issues, but uh, uh, there are new challenges uh, that we are seeing today that I hope I can uh, emphasize a little bit more uh, with you. So in terms of the outline and what I'm going to be talking to you I'm going to start with a brief introduction. I really want to focus my uh, uh, your attention um, and my talk on on realities that are associated with the field of ethics in biobanking. And these rea realities are very important. When we're talking about ethics in biobanking, we're talking about ethics or law in biobanking. We can't do that in the abstract. We really need to be cognizant of the context. And there are new realities that I will discuss with you. There's actually three realities that I want to focus on today. And then I'm going to talk about um, three main issues. Um, consent, uh, obviously, is, is something that we need to talk about. It's a must. I know that there was a, a, a talk uh, today around that. Uh, I'm, hopefully, I'll be uh, focusing more on the conceptual matters rather than the form itself. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about data sharing and the importance of data sharing and collaboration between researchers and, uh, and how this um, collaboration has moved from being a scientific imperative to being actually a ethical imperative. Uh, so this is another element that I wish uh, we can uh, talk about today. And finally, I want to talk to you about the return of results and, and the return of research results and its initial findings. Um, this is an emerging topic uh, that biobanks will have to deal with especially those that uh, are disease-specific in nature, um, because what we can't consider the, uh, the, um, what we consider the, the delineation between clinical and, and research is becoming more and more uh, blurry, and, and this has effects on how we see our duties. So today we're going to try to look at all these three elements, but um, proposing perhaps some um, pathways to solutions and, and, and a roadmap to how we can deal with this in the future. And then I'm going to conclude with some remarks. So let's start with, um, you know, the, the discovery of the, you know, the or the sequencing of the, of the genome back in around 2003, we were able to sequence more than 88% of it. And this was very important. This is the first reality that I want to talk to you about, which is the unleashing of uh, a scientific discovery for the next couple of decades. Um, you know, in the past, we were able to, um, you know, sort of have an idea about the fact that, you know, chronic diseases, whether it's cancer or it's diabetes, had multiple factors. But now we were able to actually prove that, and uh, we're studying, you know, genetics. We're studying gene gene interactions. We're studying how genes interact with the lifestyle, how they interact with, um, uh, um, you know, not only with the lifestyle but also with the environment, and all these matters are, are best encapsulated in the works of biobanks because we're able to store data and samples for multiple years and be able to study all these different interactions. Um, 
but at the same time, what this has brought is hype um, and, and hope, yes, but also hype. People have started, you know, discussing and thinking about this uh, uh, from an angle of, well, now we're going to be able to understand everything through the field of genetics. Well, yes, and we have to be very nuanced when we say that, uh, but also there are other factors that need to be taken into consideration that will be helpful for any um, research projects or also any country who are interested in, in working in um, action plans in terms of their health or their population for the future. And this is also, um, it allows me to, to um, focus a little bit more on how that has um, impacted the um, you know, the, 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 the way participants participate in research. This is the second reality that I want to focus on today. The second reality has to do more specifically with um, what people expect from participating, especially in Biovex. This is a new reality that hasn't been done before. When we were talking about clinical trials, when we were talking about traditional research, um, fundamental research, traditional research with human subjects, um, Usually it came in as an a option um, because we're not able to do anything with the disease and uh, there is still an option of participating in this clinical trial. Mm, there might not be anything for you, but at least it's going to help us understand this more and maybe helpful to others. Um, this concept is, is challenged today because especially in the field of population biobanking, um, and this is a reality that we have to keep in mind. When we're talking about population biobanking, we're talking about people who are asymptomatic, right, from the public, who are interested in participating in research, uh, not necessarily, or at least they're told that it's not going to be for them, they should not expect any direct benefit, but it's going to be for the society or for future generations. And this concept of altruism, as we call it, is a very important one that we have to keep in mind. The reason why we have to keep it in mind it's because although people are told that they should not be expecting something, they still have some expectations. And literature on this matter, specifically the public, public perception or the participant perception, have actually shown that. It's not sacrificial. They're not sacrificing themselves. They are interested in furthering research, but at the same time, they do expect something. And I'll come back to that later on in my talk today. The third reality that I want to talk about is the effect that this has on the participant and their surroundings. So we talked about the science, first reality. We talked about the participation and what motivates people. The third element that I want to talk to you about in my introduction has to do with how that relates to the participant and to their surroundings. Science is, is quickly evolving and we're learning a lot. Uh, but at the same time, there are things that come out that we don't necessarily understand at this point. And maybe in the future, uh, um, you know, maybe in the future, in a couple of years, we'll be able to understand them more. Uh, this issue of receiving information, this issue of putting information out as scientists, has to be done very carefully. It has to be nuanced and informed. And the reason why is because people look for science and look at research and um, this is how, and I'll be talking to this uh, more specifically at the end of my talk, this is how we're going to be able to sustain their trust. Um, I don't know if some of you here have followed um, the Angelina Jolie uh, um, articles. She has written two, one when she had a double mastectomy. And this is a very interesting uh, uh, example of the importance of scientific communication. Um, so when she did... Her, the, who wrote her first article, she talked about the fact that, um, you know, she's been gone through a lot of, obviously, difficulties. Um, but when she explained it, in the same week that she wrote her article in the New York Times, multiple authors from the clinician perspective wrote articles that tried to explain what she was trying to say, or at least nuance and show the differences that she has with other people. And this is very important. Uh, even in the field of biobanking, although we're not talking necessarily about the same thing, but the field of biobanking, it is very important because there is an element of ongoing communication with participants that we have to do very carefully, right? Whether it is in terms of putting something on the website or it is in terms of sending pamphlets or information or newsletters or even publishing, we have to be very careful how we do that and how people, the surrounding, perceive it.
as well. So these are the three realities that I thought were important for us to have in the context of our discussion. Now, let's talk about the, um, I guess, the issue that has been stagnant for, for many years, which is the issue of consent. And um, the title of, of this slide is, is very indicative of what I'm trying to, 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 to send as a message, is that it does have different shades. Um, you know, I can talk about experience here in Canada. We have a population biobank, Cartagen, very successful one, but it took a long time before it was actually approved through the research ethics boards. And the reason why is because those boards had in mind a very traditional way of looking at consent, which is specific. Okay, so that requires that the participant be informed of the research, objectives, procedures, risks, benefits future uses of this data and the samples in a very detailed fashion. And we've learned very quickly that, you know, in the field of biobanking, specifically in population biobanking, as a great example of this, it's not always possible. We're not able to say to the participant uh, when they are recruited and when they come to the assessment center and they give, you know, data and provide samples, who exactly in 5, 10, or 15 years is going to be accessing their data and samples? We can't do that. We have this limitation. And therefore, specific consent has become a limitation in itself. That's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is what we call blanket consent. Okay? And um, not only this is unethical, it's also illegal. Right? This is the idea of saying simply in a consent form, um, listen, you know, you are... Uh, participating, we're going to take your data and samples and we're going to use it for research, period. That is something that we cannot do. Um, you know, we're going to have to look at the different laws from different jurisdictions, but what, if, what I've seen, if there is a law, it will not allow this. Um, and this brings me to a, a, another uh, point that I think is very, very important for us to remember. The consent form is not consent. The consent form is a form. Consent is a process, and this is something that we have to uh, be very cognizant of. The consent process is not just simply something that starts at the recruitment and ends at recruitment. It's something that is continuous and ongoing until the end. So this is where broad consent comes in. All right? So the people who are working, in the, or are working in the field of biobanking actually today use broad consent to be able to consent people. But this comes from a conceptual understanding that consent is not only free and informed, but it's also continuous. And what is broad consent? Well, it allows data and sample to be used in unforeseen or unspecified future studies. But at the same time, this is, doesn't stop there, right? Because if it stopped there, we're talking about blanket consent. At the same time, we also inform the participant how exactly we're going to govern this. And this is a very important element. So broad consent should also be coupled with ethics approval, but also with a stringent governance system. Participants need to know exactly how their data and samples will be accessed, who's going to be able to do that, what is the body that will be evaluating those access requests, and what are the terms and conditions that are going to be required from the applicant. Right. We're not going to be able to go into details about that, but we need to inform them of these elements, and they're going to consent for it. But what we're also going to do is implement ongoing communication with the participant. So what we're going to tell them is, listen, we might not be able to tell you today who's going to be accessing your data and samples, but we're going to create a public registry, and this is potentially a solution. This is something that we've seen in multiple research projects. We're going to create a public registry on our website, right, as a biobank, and inform you of the different research projects that are currently using data and samples from our biobank. And this allows the individual to be informed, right? And it's a continuous informed process because if they, for example, look at the website, see that a research project that they don't necessarily appreciate is using the data and samples, they can simply say, well, I want to withdraw. Now, if the data and samples are currently used, usually there's a limitation to withdrawal, but at least they don't want to be part of this biobank in the future. So it does still give them the opportunity and the power to um, 
decide what they're going to do with their data and samples. And, and this needs to be part of the consent process. So there's a key word here. Consent form is not consent. Consent form is representative of consent at recruitment um, and what we expect in the future. But consent is continuous until the end of the participation. This is very important. So the other thing that I want to say in very briefly is um, we had a very paternalistic uh, way of dealing with this in the past, um, especially when it comes to the clinic or it comes to research, um, but mostly in the clinical setting. The, the physician knows best, right? And we've moved very quickly, at least in, in, in some Western countries, uh, to a more individualistic conception of consent and autonomy, which is you as a participant are going to make the decisions. We're just going to be informing you whatever we need to inform you so that you can take the best informed decision. Now, this has its multiple benefits, but it also has its risks. And one of its risks is that we're really focusing our mind only on the individual participating. They need to be at the center of our preoccupations, that's for sure. But at the same time, when we're talking about biobanking and we're talking about population biobanking, there are other stakeholders that are also very important, like the public. And this is why we're seeing today in the normative uh, document landscape uh, an emphasis not only on the individual, but also on others. And the others are the society, the others are uh, the public, future generations. This is not only something that we see in the consent forms, but we also see in the um, in the different uh, uh, policies around biobanking. So we're seeing more and more trends towards reciprocity, towards uh, solidarity, towards universalism. These are things that uh, uh, you know are reflective or reflected today in those forms. The second issue that I want to talk about with the time that is remaining um, is data sharing, right? And how it has moved from a scientific imperative to an actual ethical imperative. And um, here you have in front of you uh, a couple of quotes from different normative documents. I'm just going to read one of them and then uh, uh, on this slide and then talk to you uh, more on the second slide about how this is actually concretized. So this is the Hugo Bermuda Principle of 1996, which says that it was agreed that um, the, the data that is, that is, or the sequence, was, this is more in the human genetic field, but it's also something that, that actually is useful in other forms of research. So this is the idea of actually um, taking the data that comes out of research and making it public um, as soon as possible. Uh, and the reason why is because obviously we want to stand on you know, shoulders of giants uh, so that we don't reinvent the wheel all the time. But what they say here is very, very indicative of my last point, which is they say it should be freely available and in the public domain in order to encourage research and development, but also to maximize the benefit to society. So here you see a stakeholder, another stakeholder, not only the individual, the participant. We're not saying here as to maximize benefit to the participant, we're talking about the society because here, this is society that will potentially uh, bear the fruits of this, of this participation in the future. And this is very important. Why? Because when we're talking about data sharing and we're talking about collaboration between researchers, this is where we have to start shifting our gears in terms of the culture that we're seeing. Now, I've uh, had the opportunity to talk to colleagues about you know, their own experience with collaboration in different countries around the world. And uh, one thing that I see is, well, there are some researchers that have collected the data collected the samples for research purposes, sometimes with consent, sometimes without consent, who knows, and they are storing this in their freezers, and when they are asked to do collaborations, they say, no, these are my data, these are my samples. The answer is, no, these are not your data, these are not your samples, these are data and samples that you are a custodian of, or a steward of, and if you have collected them, for research purposes, and specifically for biobanking purposes, you can't simply say, well, you know, we're, gonna, we're not going to be using them for those purposes. No, you've collected them specifically for those purposes, which is to further research. 
Okay? And this is what the European Society of Human Genetics says in its 2003 policy on this issue. It says very clearly that the value of a collection is proportional to the amount and quality of the information attached to it. It says the full benefits for which the subjects gave their samples will only be realized through maximizing collaborative high quality research, right? Because you're, you're, you're increasing your statistical power when you do that. And therefore, there is an ethical imperative to promote access and exchange of information provided confidentiality is protected. So remember when we were talking about altruism earlier on in the introduction? Well, this is where it fits best. Because when we're talking about altruism, I mentioned to you that it's not sacrificial. People still expect something, and this is what they're expecting. If they're consenting to providing their data and samples, you as a researcher have the obligation to actually use it for those purposes. So you can't simply say, well, you know, everybody do, does it, and I, nobody uh, collaborates with our way the name, and no, not anymore. Okay, you have to respect the elements that are found in the consent form. And I, I'll, I'll be more than happy to talk to you about this during the discussion period. Um, so this is what I wanted to say when it comes to uh, 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 data sharing and, and very briefly. Now, for my last issue, I want to talk to you about the return of results and incidental findings. Um, and this is, this is a slide that shows Kermit finding out about, about the fact that he is a puppet. Uh, uh, but this is something that we have to anticipate also in the field of, of biobanking, which is there will be potential research results that will emanate from our research, but at the same time, there might also be incidental findings. And throughout the years, these two concepts have been conflated. If we look at policies and documents in the past, these two uh, uh, concepts have been conflated. People thought that research results were actually incidental findings. No, they're different. Incidental findings are findings that concern an individual right, that they are discovered during the course of research but have nothing to do with the overall aim. So you're doing research on cardiovascular disease and you find something related to Alzheimer's, this is an incidental finding, okay? So the question became, what do we do with those? People who have participated in research participated because they're not expecting treatment, right, talking about altruism and the fact that there's no direct benefit, they're not expecting, they, they have participated in biobanks, they have not expected it. And, um, and therefore, what do we do when we find something? Most of the biobanks around the world have a no return policy. We're not going to return anything to you once it's stored. Before, when we're doing the assessment and we're taking your, your blood pressure and so on, if we find something abnormal, we'll let you know. But once it's stored, no return. And this is um, something that is quite challenged today. And here I'm just giving you an example from Canada. This is Article 3.4 of the Tri-Council policy statement, which says that researchers have an obligation to disclose to the participant any material incidental findings. And the way to define material is a bit problematic, to be honest with you, and this is why this article is currently being changed. But they say that material is something that is significant um, to the welfare of participants. It has significant welfare implications of the participant. So if you find something that has significant welfare implications of the participant, you have an obligation to return it. The, the article is currently being changed because we wanted to add two elements. First of all, we want to provide more guidance when it comes to uh, what exactly do we mean by severe welfare implications. And this is very important for researchers to know because otherwise they're just going to return everything. And that's not necessarily good for us or for the healthcare system. Um, the other thing is that we want to ensure that the participant has a say. Okay? Do they want to receive those back? Now, maybe you and I and everybody else might say, well, sure, if it has severe welfare implications. But the, the answer is not that easy, actually. Some people maybe are not interested. And because consent is a continuous process, even though they said yes now, you still have to offer it to them if you find it, okay? And I'm happy to discuss this when we when we get to the um, when we get to the actual um, uh, discussion period. But you need to have the um, you need to have the preferences of the participant laid out to you very clearly in the consent process. And you might also want to talk to them about their preferences when it comes to informing family members as well. So all of that 
you know, and, and here concluding with some remarks, a very important element that we need to keep, um, you know, between our eyes is, is the idea of engaging the public, engaging the community. We need to be talking to them about biobanking. And what you're doing, you know, we have been doing for, for two days now is, is an excellent example of this. It's very important for us as researchers, as ethicists, as lawyers, as biobankers, to be talking to people about biobanking and telling them about the issues and trying to come up with ways they can, you know, it can be solved. Uh, and the reason why is because it creates trust, right? This is really what we're looking for. Now, I want to say a few words about those of you who are interested in, in, in finding resources. So if you're uh, working right now on a consent form and you're not really sure what to say in the confidentiality section or whatnot, the P3G, the Public Population Project in Genomics and Society, has an IPAC service. And this IPAC service has a couple of um, uh, things that could be useful to you. And the one that I really want to focus on that very quickly is you can go on their website, www.p3g.org, and you'll find a, a number of information that could be useful to you. But one thing that they have is a generic uh, clauses database. So if you're working right now on your consent form or on your management policy or on your return of results policy um, and you're looking for ways you can write certain sections, well, they have a list of themes or issues and they provide you with examples of clauses that come from different projects. And you can look at all of those and see which one fits better. It's a way to be able to harmonize and create a, a form of interoperability, internationally speaking. The other resource that could be of interest, especially those that are more linked to policy making and to the legislative side of things, is the HumeGen International Database. The HumeGen International Database has a PopGen module, right? So this is a this is a database that includes more than 3,000 policies, laws, regulations um, on the field of human genetics, but the PopGen module focuses on biobanking more specifically. So if you're interested in seeing what is happening in Estonia, what's happening in the United States, what's happening in France, uh, what's happening in, 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 in some Arabic country, uh, if, if there's something that's out that's made public, you'll find it there. And these are um, you know, um, uh, documents that you can search from an international perspective, from a regional perspective, or from a national perspective, www.humgen.org is uh, um, you know the the link to it and hopefully you can find some you know some some of the elements that you're looking for so this is a beautiful slide I love it it's all about trust that's what it's telling us uh, and and why it's because we're trying to maintain a certain balance um, starting from the beginning uh, of my talk and ending with this it's altruism altruism is at the forefront of what we're doing today and altruism um, requires us to create uh, uh, the environment for collaboration between researchers because what we're looking for is maximizing the statistical power of our data, of our information, and standing on shoulders of giants, not having to redo what someone else has done. If it's already there, it's already there, and we can use it. Why not? Okay? It, it, it saves a lot of time. It saves a lot of energy and allows us to pursue uh, 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 you know, scientific advances much more quickly. And when we do this, when we maximize the statistical power, we're going to trickle down and translate this knowledge into the clinic more efficiently. What does that do? Well, hopefully it's going to come up with better action plans for the public, for the population, better, the betterment of the health of the population. This requires that we engage with the public, let them know what we're doing, explain to them the research project, I am sure, and, and some of the data has shown, that some people are not necessarily very comfortable. They still have this knowledge or view of the researcher as someone with, with gray hair and long you know, hair and looks very scary. Uh, research is not, it's not that, and you can all attest to that, um, unless there's someone here who has long hair, but I'm kidding. They need to know what's going on, because when they know what's going on, they're the ones who are going to have increased trust into what you're doing and this is the key word here it's trust trust will allow them to continue to be altruistic and and to and to participate in research so it's all as i mentioned it's a balance you have to maintain it from beginning to end so thank you very much for your attention i'm almost at my 30 minutes 
three seconds left, and uh, I'll be more than happy to uh, to uh, hear your questions and to answer them. Shukran jazeem.